Well, take your Bible this evening and go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you would please. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Continuing our study of the last epistle that Paul penned before they took his head off. And uh, penning it to his son in the faith, his disciple Timothy, that he uh, would be... By the way, he told the church at Philippi, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. Uh, he, he believed Timothy had his mind, he believed Timothy had his heart, and he's investing in him, and, and I feel like we're kind of we're reading their mail, you know, and uh, getting to see what he's emphasizing to Timothy, and of course, in emphasizing it to Timothy, he's emphasizing it to us, and teaching us what it's all about. Chapter 2, verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening, and as we look into your word tonight, I pray that uh, you would help us, that Holy Spirit, you would enlighten us, uh, illuminate our hearts, that we would have understanding of your word. We want to do exactly what verse 7 tells us. We want to consider this. We want you to give us understanding. The instruction here that Paul gives to Timothy under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. May he instruct us as well this evening. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. The charge to Timothy now begins in earnest. He's uh, completed kind of the introduction and things, themes he wanted to hit on in chapter 1. And now he's going to get down to the nitty-gritty and tell Timothy what he needs to be, all right? And this is what we need to be. And there's, there's, there's four different things here that he likens it to. I'm not sure I'm going to get through the whole thing or not. We'll just see how far we go uh, tonight and how the time treats us. But number one is what you need to be is a messenger. A messenger. Verse 1 says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the Lord, and be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. There's four requirements for the messenger that's mentioned here in 2 Timothy. Number one is they must be saved. If you're going to be a messenger, first of all, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Okay, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the grace of God that brings salvation. And the grace that, that has appeared unto all men. It's grace, it's grace, it's grace. If it's grace, it's no more of works. If it's of works, it's of no more of grace. So it's all by grace. Be strong in the grace. The ones who are confident of their salvation are ones who are confident in the grace of God or strong in the grace of God. When I know that God has shed His grace on me and saved me by His grace, I'm confident of salvation. Okay? And that's the ones who are sure. There are times... He's saying, Timothy... There's times you're going to need strength. There's times you're going, to, uh, you're going to think you're going to have to dig down deep to get some extra strength. He said, but Timothy, it's not your strength you have to be strong in. You better be strong in the grace of God. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. There's no uh, some hidden strength that I'm looking for in my life. I'm looking for the hidden strength that comes from Jesus Christ. He says, don't call upon your own strength, Timothy. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. He said, you better rely on the grace of... See, grace, 
Grace is God's sufficiency. Grace is, is God's favor. It's God's strength, not my strength. That's why Paul said, His grace is sufficient for me. I'd rather be weak because when I'm weak, then I am strong. What's that mean? Well, I'm weak. I don't have the strength in myself. How can I be strong? I'm strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I'm strong in His strength, not in my strength. It's not only salvation that makes us dependent on grace, but we're dependent on grace for service as well. It's not just, well, I'm saved by grace, but I serve by all my works. No, you better serve by the grace of God as well. You better serve with His strength. Serve with His sufficiency. Or you'll burn out pretty quick and fizzle out. So it's strength from God that we look to and ask for that enables us to do things that, that seemed impossible and accomplish tasks that we never thought we'd be capable of, of accomplishing. And you look back and you think, how did that happen? And you'll say, that was the grace of God that that took place and that that happened. So we have to gain strength by God's grace. So if we're a messenger, we have to be saved and be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. So number two, we have to listen. We must listen. He said in verse 2, The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. You heard of me. What did Timothy hear from Paul? What Timothy heard from Paul was Scripture. He taught him the Word of God. Taught him the Bible. Not fables, not oral traditions, not psychology, but God's Word. And he gave him the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so he's saying, I want you to listen carefully. He that hath, Jesus would say, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. James says, let every man be swift to hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. Okay, Hear, listen. I must be careful to listen to God's Word. And so pay attention to the Word of God. Don't, don't make sure you're listening. Make sure you're, you're not just... Uh, it, make sure when the pastor's teaching or someone's teaching... Don't, don't let your mind go here and mind go there and all you hear is wah, 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 wah. Don't, don't let that happen. Say, oh no, there's something here for me and I want to listen. This is God's Word. And I want to hear it. I want to be a good messenger. I have to be saved. I have to listen. Thirdly, I have to live faithfully. Notice what he says. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. What kind of men? Faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Commit these things to faithful men. What's faithful? Dependable. What's faithful? Reliable. What's faithful? Steadfast. What's faithful? It means always the same. See, being faithful is knowing and choosing what matters the most. Sometimes we miss what it really means when the Bible says somebody's faithful. We think somebody's faithful is one who's just doing what is expected. In other words, we say, well, they're a faithful worker, implying he does his job as he's told to do it. Or he's a faithful husband, or she's a faithful wife, simply meaning that they don't cheat on their spouse. They're faithful to them. But the faithful one in the Bible is not just someone who passively does what they should do, but it's one who has a grasp of priorities. It's one who understands what's really important in life. Not, in other words, I know what matters the most and I'm going to give that the priority in my life to make sure that gets done. To make sure that, I, that that gets accomplished each and every day. The faithful life is a life that's defined by priority. We don't just live slipshod. We live by priorities. We make sure that some things get done first. God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. When He talked about giving, He said, you, you, you put lay aside upon the first day of the week. There are priorities with God. There are some things that are first. There are some things that have to come in order of importance. And so the faithful life says, I'm going to know and I'm going to commit to fulfill in my life what matters most. 
that is going to be a priority with me, and I'm going to see to it that that gets done. See, we're not called to just waste our lives or live our lives with, hey, whatever comes, whatever happens, happens. Whatever's going to happen today, going to happen today. I'll just take it as it comes. No, we're called to live on purpose. We're not just wasting our lives and living slipshod. We're to live our life for what really counts. You know why? Why do you live for God? Why do you go to church on Wednesday night? Why do you get up early tomorrow morning and get your Bible out and make sure you read the Bible and spend time with God? Why is that important to you? Because God says that's a priority. Because I know this is not all there is. There's another life after this one. That is the one that really counts. And that's the one I'm preparing for. See, so faithful. Faithful. Are you a faithful Christian? So the messenger is saved, the messenger listens, the messenger lives faithfully, and then fourthly, the messenger must be able to teach others. Did you notice? Able to teach others also. You understand what disqualifies you from teaching others? Not being faithful. He said, Timothy, I committed these things to you. Why did Paul commit those things to Timothy? Because Timothy was faithful. Timothy shows, I'm going to live my life for what matters most. And he saw that in Timothy. That's why he told the church in Philippi, he's a man who's like-minded. He, he put things in perspective. Paul's the one who said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Savior. He said, I'm looking... I'm looking for the, the, to know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. And then he said, Timothy thinks just like I do. And that's why I've committed these things to him because he's faithful. And, and now you're able to teach somebody else. One of the reasons why you struggle sometimes with wanting to teach someone else is you never establish faithfulness yourself. You've got to establish that faithfulness in your life. So God can use you to teach others what you have been taught. Every believer ought to be able to teach somebody else. Every believer ought to be able to teach somebody else. Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, or, or give the gospel to all nations. And, and then He said, Once you see them saved, you're to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then what? Teaching them to observe all things, what I've commanded you. Every one of us ought to be able to do that. Is this on? Every one of us ought to be able to do that. Every one of us ought to be able to teach others the things that He's commanded us. But you've got to have faithfulness. That's the messenger. We're all messengers. Timothy, you're a messenger. So are we. Messenger saved. Messenger has to uh, listen. Messenger has to live faithfully. And a messenger has to teach others. Then he goes on to give another, I guess, analogy or picture to help us know what we are to be. Not only messengers, but notice verse number 3. He says, we're supposed to be good soldiers. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting, when you talk about being a soldier of Christ, that means we must be in the army, or we must be in the service, amen? Now, i got news for you. It's an all-volunteer army. Okay? And uh, when you signed up, you accepted Christ as your Savior, uh, you became a volunteer in the army of God. And you have to understand, the enlistment into the army of God isn't for a three-year stint. And it's not for a five-year hitch. Okay? It's not for 20 years and then you get your retirement. Okay? It's a lifetime enlistment. It's, it's all the way until the Lord comes back. And, and then we go to heaven to be with Him. It is everlasting. His army is eternal. In fact, at the end of the tribulation, when He comes back to put down Satan and his forces and the forces of the Antichrist, we're coming, He comes back on that white horse, we're coming back with Him. We're in the army of God. And uh, we're coming back with Him to put down the forces of of the Antichrist. We don't do anything. We just watch Jesus win it all. But uh, we're there. Amen. And uh, so, so we're enlisting. You know, when a, 
we have, how many of you were in the service, yeah, in some branch of the service, okay? Brother Marquardt, what branch were you in? In the Navy. Now, when you signed up in the Navy, and you, you signed up, and you enlisted, and they got you in, and then they, they talked about sending you to where the battle is. And you said, wait a minute. You mean I might die? Whoa, wait, I didn't sign up for that. <laughs> no, that's not true, is it? When you signed up, or in some, some of your older men's cases, you, you, were, you didn't have a choice. They told you you're going. But the truth is, when you sign up, and Jeanette, you've had boys that have enlisted. You know what they're enlisting to do? They're enlisting saying, I'm willing to die for my country. That there's something I believe in that I'm willing to die for. Hmm? Well, when you enlist in the army of God, you're enlisting saying, I believe there's something here I'm willing to die for. I'm willing to lay down my life for. I'm willing to, uh, th that this is something worth dying for. So he says, you're a soldier, Timothy. Well, we don't hear a lot about that anymore. But you're a soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, what does he point out here about soldiers? Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier. Endure hard things. Those of you who are in the service, you have to endure some hard things. Do you have to endure being called some names? Hmm? Yeah, especially by drill sergeants. Huh? By, by people calling you grunts and other things. You know what you do? You, don't, you didn't look at your, your sergeant. You didn't look at your commanding officer and say, you know, that really offended me. Huh? That didn't work. You know, it's funny. Someone, I was reading something. I think I told Brother Wallace a few days ago. I was reading an article, I think, and somebody said the problem or the difference between the church from the 50s and 60s and even into the 70s and the church now, people used to say, that convicts me. And now they say, that offends me. The preacher used to preach and people would say, boy, that convicted me and I need to get right with God. Now they say, boy, that offends me. I'm not going back there anymore. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endure hardness. Said, so, Timothy, you're going to have to get tough. You're going to endure persecutions. You're going to go through slander. You're going to have lack of money. You're going to have false brethren. You're going to encounter inconsistent Christians. You're going to have critics of the Bible. You're going to have opposition from the world, the flesh, and the devil. You better learn to endure some hardness. As a soldier who has to maybe sleep in the rain, eat K-rations or worse, fight without food for 48 hours, see some men go crazy around you, lose their mind, some friends get killed by the enemy, what do you do? You endure hardness as a good soldier. Tertullian wrote in his address to the martyrs. He said, No soldier comes to the war surrounded by luxuries, nor goes into action from a comfortable bedroom, but from the makeshift and narrow tent where every kind of hardness and severity and unpleasantness is to be found. John Stott wrote, Soldiers on active service did not expect a safe or an easy time. They take hardship, risk, and suffering as a matter of course. And we can't even get Christian soldiers to go to church three times a week. Let alone uh, give a revival meeting and come five nights in a row. That's just, that's just too hard. That's too tough. I'm too tired. When we have air-conditioned building and padded pews and all the luxuries you could want. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Never underestimate. A soldier never underestimates the enemy's strength. A good soldier will obey all the orders under all circumstances. A good soldier will trust his commanding officer's commands even in trying situations. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 
So he's saying you don't. You have to endure hardness as a soldier. Look at verse 4. No man that warreth, that's what soldiers do, they fight, they war, entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. The second thing a soldier does, he doesn't get entangled with worldliness. He doesn't get entangled with the affairs of this life. Now, you've got to deal with them. We're in the world. We're not of the world. But we're in the world. There's bills to pay. There's things that have to be taken care of, and we have to pay some attention to them, but we're not to get entangled with them. The word entangled means interweaved, so it is difficult to separate. Interweaved, so it's difficult to pull them apart. Soldiers do not concern themselves with the trivial matters of civilian life. When you go into the service, any branch of the service, you know what they do? They provide your food, your clothing, and your shelter. You don't have to give that a thought. You don't have to give it a thought where, when the, what you're going to eat next. You don't give it a thought what you've got to put on. You don't have to give it a thought where you're sleeping. All that is taken care of. Because they don't want... Listen, you're, you're called to defend your country and you're not going to have your focus on defending your country and being a good soldier if you're concerned about what I'm going to eat tomorrow. Or what am I, where am I going to sleep tonight? Where, what, what am I going to put on tomorrow? What do I wear? Why don't I have any clothes? No, they take care of those distractions so you can focus on the job at hand. What did Jesus tell us? Didn't He say, take no thought? What you shall eat? Or what you shall wear? huh? What Doesn't your Heavenly Father know you have need of those things? So God says, I'll take care of those. Do you think that, that the, 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 the commanding officers of the armies of this world will take better care of their soldiers than our commanding officer would take care of his? So why do we get so concerned about those things? Don't get entangled with the affairs of this life. They don't get caught up in all the things of this world. By the way, that's hurt our military. Is uh, We've had, we've had uh, such poor leadership in our government and in some of our commander-in-chiefs that they have entangled our military with the affairs of this world. And that's hurt our military. The military is not the place for affirmative action or equal rights or homosexuals. That's not where we do the experiments of the society inside of our military. That's entangling them with the affairs of this life. What happens when we get entangled? Hold your finger there in 2 Timothy 2 and look at a couple of verses with me, will you? Pick up Matthew 13, please. Matthew chapter 13. And once you get Matthew 13, get Mark chapter 4. Mark 4, Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, verse 22, this is both the account of the parable of the sower that Jesus talked about. And he's talking about the ground or the seed that fell among the thorns. Matthew 13 and verse 22, He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and notice, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. What do they do, church? Choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. You know what happens when a soldier, as a soldier of Christ, if I get too entangled, caught up with the things of this world, it chokes the word right out of my life. It chokes the word right out of my life, and it becomes unfruitful. Other people will talk about a Bible verse and what God's done in their heart with the word of God, and you kind of look at them like, Oh, that's nice. Because you have no idea what they're talking about. Because the Word doesn't have that effect in you. It's become unfruitful. Why? You've choked it out. Because we're more concerned about who's on American Idol. Or who's the next voice. Or what, what, what about what, who's the bachelor going to have or the, whatever the thing is. See, we get so entangled. And then, well, church is kind of boring. Mark 4, Mark chapter 4, 
same parable. Jesus is, this is Mark's account of what Jesus said. And here, notice again, he uses the same terminology. And some, verse 7, Mark 4, verse 7, and some fell among thorns. The thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. How do you know if you're entangled? How do you know if, if you become too interwoven with the things of this life? Well, you can tell because you say things like, oh, I'm just too tired to pray. Well, I, I, I'd come out and go soul winning. I'm just so busy. Well, I'm just... I just, I just have too much work to get to church, Pastor. Pastor, I've got too many bills to, to tithe. I'm too busy to, to read the Bible. Then you're getting entangled in the things of the world with the affairs of this life. A good soldier has to endure hardness. A good soldier doesn't get entangled with the affairs of this life. Because three, C, he's in it to please Jesus Christ. He told Timothy, you don't, you, if you're going to war, you don't entangle yourself with the affairs of this life. Why? That he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So you can please Jesus Christ. Where to please Him? A soldier sticks out. They're not entangled with the things of the world. In fact, back in the day, even when they went into town, they wore their uniform. You ever watch Gomer Pyle? Huh? When him and Sergeant Carter and those guys went into town, they wore their uniform. Why? They knew you weren't a civilian. You weren't one of them. Oh, I long for the day when the world could once again look at Christians and realize I don't think they're one of us. And that's okay. It ought to be at some time, there ought to be a difference between Christians and non-Christians. The Bible says it ought to be as different as light and dark. It ought to be obvious to people that we're Christians. And who were in this to please? Were separated. Listen, they were separated from those who were not enlisted. Separated from those who weren't in the army. And we're in this not to try to be like everybody else. We're in it to please Jesus Christ. We're in it to please Him. He's the one who called us. He's the one who saved us. He's the one who enlisted us in the army. We're just in it to please Him. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You know, after a, a battle or after a war, they give out medals and things of honor to those who, who served well in the war or did heroic things during the, the, the uh, battle or the, the conflict. And they always have a grand review. The big brass is there. The crowd will come. Family members invited. And it's a big deal. One day, we're going to have one of those. In the Bible, it's called the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to stand before Him to receive from Him the things we've done while in uniform, whether they be good or bad. We're going to receive the things that we've done. You read about that in 1 Corinthians 3 and in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. What are we doing? Did, why did, we, did, we, did we please Him? Or did we try to look good to everybody else? When we, when, do we, is our first thought, what does God want? What will please the Lord? Or is it, what will, what will this person think of me if I do that? What will my neighbors think if I do that? What will my co-workers think if I do this? 
Or will it be, what does Jesus want me to do? What is Jesus pleased with? A soldier is to please him who called him to be a soldier. Onward Christian soldiers marching as to war. We don't, we don't hear so much. We, we've, I'm afraid we've, we've emphasized so much the relationship, having the relationship with Jesus Christ, we've totally abandoned the fact we're soldiers in an army. Let's listen to our commander. You were in the Marines. You had a drill sergeant. Were you concerned about having a close relationship with your drill sergeant? No. And you know what? He wasn't that interested in that one with you, was he? He was more interested in are you obeying what he commands you to do? That's what he's after. You say, well, and listen, I want to ask you a question. And, and listen, I, I think, I believe there's a side of, of this that we don't, we can have a relationship with our commanding officer. We can have a, a, an intimate relationship with him. But listen to me. He's still the commanding officer. He's still the boss. And we ought to report for duty and say, yes, sir. What do you want me to do? And be ready to do whatever he tells us to do. We're soldiers. We're here to obey orders. We're here to report for duty. Another songwriter wrote this. He said, Am I a soldier of the cross? A follower of the Lamb? Shall I fear to own His cause or blush to speak His name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend to grace to help me on to God? Sure, I must fight if I would win. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by Thy Word. Am I a soldier of the cross? Are you a good soldier of Jesus Christ? Are you a messenger of Jesus Christ? And he's not done. He gives us four different things here, four different analogies of what, what it's like to, to be a servant of God. He says, you're going to be a messenger. You're going to be a soldier. Now look with me at verse number 5. And if a man also strive for masteries, Yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. Here's, here's the example of an athlete. An athlete striving for masteries or striving to be the best. What's on the heart of a, an athlete, A, first of all, is to win. An athlete will stay on a strict diet and training regimen whether it's in a gym or a pool or a track or a skating rink. They'll get up early in the morning and practice and then go to school or maybe a, a, a job and then they'll get off and there'll be more practice and then there's dinner and then there's more practice and they work and they train and they, they, they're disciplined. Why? They want to win. They want to strive for mastery. They want to be the best in their sport. They don't just want to be adequate. They don't just want to be average. They don't just want to be good enough. They want to win. When Mark Spitz first won the seven gold medals in Mexico Olympics, his mother said how he would train and he wouldn't even get out of the pool to eat. They'd set a plate down beside the pool and he would eat in the pool and keep on swimming. What, what drove him? How, you look at him and say, how do you win seven gold medals? That's how. Who else did that? Nobody. Nobody. Let me ask you a question. Do you desire to be the best Christian you can be? Or are you content to say, well, I'm average. Good enough. It's the, it's the Major League Baseball playoffs now. Teams have played the 162-game regular season, and now it's the, just a few teams that are in the playoffs. 
four, and it'll end up being four in the American League, four in the National League. Eight teams out of, what, 30-some Major League Baseball teams. If I'm on one of those other 20-some teams, and I'm sitting home and it's October, I'm not a happy guy. Why? Because I'm not playing for the championship. Don't, don't play just to play. The men, the men who, who have something in them say, I'm not just playing for the money. I'm playing because I want to win. Wanna, I want to excel at my sport. Can they put more effort into their athletics than we do into Christianity? Can they put more effort into winning an earthly prize than we do to gain a heavenly prize? You know, you never win until you have a desire to win. Until there's a will to win. I think it was Tom Landry or it was him or... Uh, uh, the Packers' famous coach, uh, Lombardi, who, who made the statement that most of the pro football teams, the talent on both sides is just about the same. In most cases, those 11 men on each side of the ball, there's not that great of a difference. What it usually comes down to is who wants to win Who has the will to win? Where are the Christians that have the will to win and be the very best they can be for God? So, the athlete strives for masteries, yet it says here, he's not crowned. So you're not going to win except you strive how? Verse 5, and step you strive lawfully. That means I, I want to win, but i got to still play by the rules. Those blasted rules. I mean, there's boundaries, yeah. I mean, if I don't win fair, I don't win. Yeah, that's it. In, in swimming, you got to stay in your lane. You can't... You can't get the lead on some guy and you go over and cut him off like you're in Columbus traffic. You can't do that. In baseball, there's foul balls and fair balls. There's balls, there's strikes. In football, you're inbounds or out of bounds. In football, you can't be a receiver and run down, uh, cut in behind your bench, you know, and then come back on the field and get open and catch the ball. That's illegal. Penalty flag. You're not allowed to do that. That's against the rules. See, you, you have rules in every single sport there is. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Would you turn there with me, please? Are you doing okay? We're trying to work through this here. I hope you're all right. 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I do recognize only about three of you said you're okay. The rest of you just bear with it, all right? Hang in there. Notice 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24. Paul said, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery, you're going you're gonna to strive to win, is temperate in all things. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. And he said, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep my body and bring it under subjection, lest by any means when I have preached others, I myself should be a castaway. He's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm not as a, a, a fighter who just swings at the air. If I'm a fighter, I've got to swing to land some punches. In fact, in boxing, there's, even in boxing there's rules. 
You can't punch a guy in the kidneys. There's no hitting below the belt. There's rules in boxing. You can't put a horseshoe inside your club and whack somebody. Okay? That's not allowed. It's against the rules. You have to strive lawfully. There's no crown if you don't do it within the rules. Oh, when was that? Years ago. Uh, the Boston Marathon. Uh, a woman named Rosie Ruiz. Do you remember that? She crossed finish line. And, and the, first, the first thing they got suspicious was she wasn't hardly sweating. You run 26 miles and you hardly break a sweat. Something's going on. Well, they begin to investigate and find out, yeah, she started the race and then dropped out, caught a cab, ended up, I think she had something to eat at a restaurant first, then she caught a cab, ended up getting out about a mile from the finish line and then finished the race. And here they, they thought she was the winner and everybody was uh, hailing what a great job she was, the first woman, and what a great time she had until they found out she didn't run lawfully. She doesn't get anything. She doesn't get anything. There's always boundaries to stay in if you're going to have success. And God, God has boundaries as well. And success comes within those boundaries. And we have a day and age where, where men want to say there are no boundaries, just whatever works. That's what we'll do. Whatever gets a crowd that's what we'll do. That's called, there's a word for that, it's called pragmatism. Pragmatism is a fancy word that says whatever works. If, 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 in other words, the goal, if the goal is I just want a big crowd, then I say, okay, let's get uh, some uh, guitars and drums and uh, get some music cranked up in here and get some screens and let's, let's just get a crowd in. If it works, that's what we use. But see, there's boundaries. We, we talked a few weeks in Sunday school a few weeks ago about Nadab and Abihu. You remember that? Some of you in my Sunday school class, Nadab and Abihu, who, who felt like they could just light their own fire and bring it to offer to God. How did God feel about that? <laughs> there was fire that was always burning on the altar continually. That's the fire they're to have in their censers. That's the fire they're to offer to God. That fire was consecrated to God. They didn't think, oh, well, that doesn't matter. Well, it mattered to God, didn't it? You know what happened? God sent fire out from him and he burnt them to a crisp. And so we find out that you don't just worship God any way you want with no boundaries. There's boundaries. You see, the problem is, this isn't my church. It isn't even your church. Jesus Christ said, upon this rock I will build my church. Whose church is it? Jesus Christ. Who's the head of the church? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Say, oh, the pastor's head of the church. No, he's not. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And so it's his church. So we don't have a right to run it the way we want. We only have the responsibility to run it the way he wants. The way he says. And he told us, he gave us the boundaries upon which to operate his church. And I have to, if, if we have to go outside those boundaries to be considered success, we're not a success in God's eyes. So that's not success. We have to be success in God's eyes. So I'd rather be a success in the eyes of God than a success in the eyes of man. So he says you're a messenger, you're a soldier, you're an athlete, and then back to 2 Timothy, and we'll wrap it up. He says you're also a farmer. Aren't you happy about that? You're a farmer. Verse 6, The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. You know what a farmer has to do? He has to, he has to stay by the crops and he has to work the ground. I know this is, this is something that's, that's strange to most of this generation. You, I, I read not too long ago, you know, they, they, gave, uh, they gave a test to, I think it was uh, junior hires. And, and one of the questions on there is, where does milk come from? And over 80% of them said the supermarket. They didn't know. They're not, we're, we're not, 
that agricultural country anymore. There's, there's probably, if we had all the kids in here, and you know, how many have ever been on a real farm and been around cows and chickens and goats and all that? Probably very few of them. That's, that's very foreign to them. So when we talk about being a farmer, sometimes we don't get that. But you know, listen, if the messenger is not faithful, there's no message. If the soldier does not fight and endure hardness, there's no victory. If the athlete doesn't strive lawfully, then there's no mastery, there's no winning. And if the farmer doesn't work and labor, then there's no crop or harvest. The farmer has to break up the ground, he has to plant the seed, he has to water the seed, he has to weed the field, he maybe put a wall or a fence up to keep animals or critters out, but it's all work. He is, and, and the good news is, he gets to be first partaker of the fruits. He gets to enjoy the fruit of his labor. There's two things that are stressed here with the farmer. Number one, of course, is labor. You know, it's funny. Back when, I'd say 50 years ago, 60 years ago, when, when there were many people who worked on the farm, sun up to sun down, nobody ever heard of high cholesterol. Nobody ever heard of high blood pressure. Huh? And, and they ate ham and eggs every morning. But they worked. They worked it off. They worked hard. I remember my, my brother had a, you've heard me talk a little bit about my brother growing up. He had, a, he had, he had some trouble through his uh, junior high and high, in early in high school years. And has a, after his freshman year of high school, he went out and lived with my uncle June in uh, Arkansas. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of it, Park in Arkansas. And um, it, just a, a little, little blop on the map there. But Uncle June had a farm. They were farmers. And boy, was my brother in for a surprise. 5 a.m., we're up. Summertime, 5 a.m., you're up. And you're out to the field about 6 a.m. You have breakfast, a good breakfast, and by 6 a.m., they're out the field. And, buddy, they didn't leave the field till usually 6 or 7 at night. Come back home and have supper. And he was ready to drop into bed. That was work, brother, out in that Arkansas sun throughout the summertime. And he, and he learned how hard it is to be a farmer. You know, exhausted. You know the song, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder, I'll Be There? I think the third verse of that song says, Let us... Labor for the Master from the dawn till setting sun. You ever done that? Oh, I know people who will go out uh, with, uh, to, to a softball tournament or soccer tournament, start at 8 o'clock in the morning and go all day long till the sun sets at night and go home. There are people for a football game it'll happen this Saturday at Ohio State they don't play till four o'clock in the afternoon there'll be people out there at eight o'clock in the morning ready to tailgate and they'll tailgate all day and the game will be at four it won't be over till 7 30 or eight o'clock and they'll tailgate some more and they probably won't get home till 10 o'clock at night do you know do you ever know what it's like to come home exhausted from serving God all day We've come home from ball games all day and been exhausted or come home from the swimming pool all day and be exhausted. Come home from the family reunion all day and be exhausted or the amusement park or from the shopping mall. But have ever come home from serving God all day and been exhausted? And say, I labored for God all day today. Labor. Work. Work. Farmer. Husbandman. Two things, labor, the second thing he said about the farmer needs is patience. Patience. The farmer has to wait for the crop. Oh, he works and he plows and he plants and he weeds and he fertilizes and he waters, but he waits. You have to be patient for God to give the increase. 
patience. We don't, we don't like that word in America. <laughs> patience. Was, I was, uh, it was interesting. Uh, if I think of anything else interesting, I'll let you know. And uh, it was, uh, Brother Rick Stone Street was a pastor out in California. He retired. And he's helping Brother Hamilton. He's, uh, he's, he's a good friend with John Hamilton from South Carolina. And he's helping a church there who uh, is needing to call a pastor, but they dwindled down to just a handful of people. And he's just volunteering there to, to be their interim pastor for a year or two and try to get the church built up some so they can call a pastor. Now, do you understand the difference between having lived in Northern California for 25 years and now living in South Carolina? There is a difference in the pace of life. He said he pulled into the gas station and he's going to get some diesel. And there's one guy on one side of the pump and one guy pulled on the other side of the pump and they're just talking to each other. Hey, Jim, Bob. Hey, Larry. And they're just having a good talk. And he said, I almost blew the horn. And I thought, I better not do that. They're just talking. And so he just shut his truck off and sat there till they were done. And then pulled his truck up to fill up. He said, because, you see, relationships are the most important thing. Not everybody's in a hurry to get something done. And, and he, he, if he's learning patience. Brother, Brother Yoder over there in Uganda is exercising patience. Nothing goes on time. Where you find that mostly when you travel overseas. Americans are the one are, come on, stay on schedule. Most other places are not like that. Patience. Patience. The, the, the chaplain Monday night was very concerned because, you know, outside of Brother Wallace and I, we just had four inmates there, and he was concerned we'd be discouraged. Well, we had a wonderful time with these four guys who came. And we're not in it for the short haul. We're in it for the long haul. We're going to have patience to see God do a work. And so, you, in, if, in due season ye shall reap, if you what? Faint not. Just stay at it. Keep laboring. That's why he said in verse 7, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Consider what I say, and the Lord will give you understanding. Understanding that you be a messenger, that you be a soldier, that you be an athlete, and you be a farmer. And you serve Jesus Christ. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Well, we'll pick up next week with some uh, principles that he wants Timothy to have and, and keep in mind, all right? Let's stand together and let you go home, all right? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention tonight. Lord, thank you for them bearing with a little bit longer of a study this evening. Lord, I'm, I'm thankful for people who enjoy hearing the Word of God, and I pray that you've spoken to hearts tonight. And that, Lord, we would go home and meditate a little bit on this passage and what Paul desired Timothy to be and yea what he would desire us to be and Lord I pray that each of us would realize one day we'll give an account and that you as Hebrews 6 10 tells us are not unrighteous to forget our labor of love that you'll reward us and we're so thankful Lord you you're the one who enables us. You're the one who strengthens us. You're the one who helps us. You're the one who really does it all through us. And yet you'll still give us a reward. Thank you for being gracious. Thank you for loving us. Lord, dismiss us now tonight and make us mindful that you go with us. And I pray we'll go out to impact our world for Jesus Christ. Help us to be yielded to you. 
Make us mindful of your presence. May others see Christ in us this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.